Hello, I'm Peter Alden. I'm here on behalf of the Concord Land Conservation Trust, a great group saving a lot of the lands that were special to Henry Thoreau and special to all of us today. Uh, before we get started, I just want to say thank you to the Land Trust for their support for a project I was involved with, with the, well, the Walden Woods Project, the Minuteman National Historic Park, National Geographic, uh, and it's something we do every 10 years here in the Concord area to celebrate the birthdays of a fam famous naturalist named E.O. Wilson who lives in nearby Lexington. Uh, so this year, well actually it was 2019, we went out with hundreds of experts from around the country and some from overseas and we managed to find 2,242 species of birds, mammals, frogs, fish, all kinds of insects and spiders and lichens and mosses and mushrooms and all sorts of wildflowers, native and invasive, and trees and shrubs here within five miles of Walden Pond. Thank you to the Land Trust. Uh, my name is Peter Alden, uh, again, and I was born here in Concord, uh, and I've been here a few years. And this behind me is the Assabet River um, in West Concord here right now. And we here in Concord, in addition to Henry Thoreau's notes on birds in particular, we have our own town bird book, Birds of Concord, by Ludlow Griscom that came out in the 1950s. Uh, since then, there's been a revision of that by Dick Walton, who lives at Concord Green, uh, the birds of the Sudbury Valley, which is Concord and a few neighboring towns. And we actually had a guy named David Sibley that we were fortunate to have living here in Concord for many years until recently when he moved out to the Connecticut Valley, who did some best-selling books, uh, The Sibley Guide to Birds, uh, maybe more than you want to know, but it's a fabulous book. Uh, and also, I did a book, uh, this is an older cover, The Audubon Field Guide to New England, with a thousand birds, flowers, trees, and shrubs uh, that are common here in New England. And uh, uh, we hope you might be interested. This is available at the moment at Barrel Farm, and when things settle down here with the coronavirus, uh, you might try the Concord Bookstore, the shop at Walden Pond, where I work. Uh, and also the gift shop in Lincoln at the Audubon Society. Uh, great bunch of people. If you're interested in binoculars, and don't try birding without binoculars, get in touch with me if you want some inexpensive, close focusing, wide angle uh, binoculars. Uh, I work for a group called Opticron. Uh, I can be reached here in Concord at 369-5768 or at peteralden at aol.com. Today we want to introduce you to some of the birds of May. Uh, birds, many of which have come up here from various parts of Latin America, some of them from the, actually as far away as the Amazon or Argentina. Uh, some of them are very colorful, some of them have some very special songs, and we're going to do a selection of 30 or so species uh, which you might be seeing on your walks on land trust property, on town property, federal property, state property, in Concord and vicinity. So a lot of birds around, the woods are going to be full of music for the next few months, and so here are some of the birds of May. And thank you again for the Land Trust for putting this together. Uh, the first one we're going to do is the wood duck, a charming little duck, very dark, fast flying, nests in holes in trees, uh, and also in those boxes you see at the Great Meadows National Wildlife Refuge. The male is unbelievably beautiful, although you don't get too close to it too often. The female has a white eye ring and when the babies are ready to leave their tree in the hole, which might be 80 feet up in a tree, or one of these uh, wood duck boxes that are put up especially for them, all the babies jump out before they can fly and they flutter down like little butterflies into the leaves. Uh, but a delightful bird, the wood duck. The great blue heron, uh, which did not nest here in Henry's day, um, was probably shot at quite a bit. Uh, we had a huge colony south of White Pond, which some of you may have joined me on some walks. Uh, a number of years ago, which ended up being 71 nests. Today we have a few scattered nests of great blue herons. On the new bike trail, the Freeman Bike Trail, just north of Williams Road, is something called Duggan Pond. And there's several great blue herons nesting there. And there's a few elsewhere uh, in town, particularly in the north side of town. Another bird that's come north recently, uh, uh, in fairly big numbers, is the turkey vulture, but only in the summer. Uh, they're nesting on Fairhaven Hill somewhere, and probably somewhere here in West Concord. Uh, the turkey vulture with a red head, and it always flies with its wings up at about a 15 degree angle. The osprey started nesting here in Concord just recently, out near the stop and shop on the Acton line, and now there's an active nest up uh, 
Spencer Brook, Brook Valley, and it does feed uh, in various ponds around here and has been harassed by bald eagles, which are suddenly newly present here in the summertime in Concord. The bald eagle, our cherished national bird and symbol of American freedom and probably a few bad things as well, uh, is basically the white-headed fish vulture. It feeds mainly on fish. We are so pleased uh, to have a, the first ever nest in Concord at a secret location on private property uh, on the edges of Fairhaven Bay. Uh, there's another nest up in Acton at Nagog Pond. And we're seeing the bald eagles along our rivers here at all of our different ponds, including White Pond, Walden Pond, Sandy Pond in Lincoln, and at Great Meadows. Uh, about 10 days ago, I saw a baby being fed by the female on its nest there at Fairhaven Bay. And we're so pleased to have them as part of our fauna again. The red-tailed hawk, if you see a hawk flying in the sky or sitting on a telephone pole, it is a red-tailed hawk, regardless of what it looks like. Most immature hawks are striped below and rather difficult to identify. The full red-tailed adult does have that sort of chestnut, rusty tail and is our basic common hawk, although Cooper's hawks are the ones that fly around. Just heard a spotted sandpiper here on the Assabet River going wheat wheat. Uh, the killdeer is our only plover that breeds in Concord these days. Uh, the killdeer has two little black lines on the chest, and the best place to see it is probably the vast fields around uh, Nine Acre Corner, around Verrill Farm, uh, and possibly up at Hutchins Farm in some very wide areas. Uh, the killdeer puts on a broken wing act. If you get near its uh, eggs or babies, uh, it'll distract you and you follow it away. It looks like it's been shot and then eventually it flies away and you forgot where you first saw it and hopefully the babies are okay. The spotted sandpiper they just called here from the Assabet River Valley opposite uh, some beautiful woods called the Assabet Bluffs at the moment near the bike trail is our only sandpiper that breeds inland in Massachusetts. It has spots on the belly and then in the winter time it flies all the way down to the Amazon. I've been working in a hundred countries around the world as an ecotourism bird watching guide and I can go down to Manaus, Brazil, which I have been doing for like 10 years, and there's our spotted sandpipers down there in the Amazon. And then every year it'll fly back up here to Concord, Mass. The morning dove uh, is for many people who get interested in birds, they hear the morning dove going, it's coo, 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 and they think, wow, there's an owl outside. And you look around, you don't see an owl, all you see is our morning dove, uh, which has replaced. Uh, somewhat, the only bird that has gone extinct in Concord since Henry David's time. The only bird he saw that none of us are ever going to see is wild pigeons or passenger pigeons, which he saw in the mid-1800s and are completely gone. But we do have the morning doves here partly to replace them. The chimney swift looks like a swallow, sort of, or a flying cigar, as Roger Torrey Peterson called it. And they fly around from our chimneys and maybe a few old dead tree hollows and catch all sorts of insects on the wing. The chimney swift is all slaty, gray colored. You'll never see it sitting on a wire or a dead tree. They only cling inside of chimneys, inside of hollow trees, and perhaps some waterfalls here and there. And every one of those chimney swifts flies down through Texas, Mexico, all of Central America, flies over the Andes, and spends the, our winter in the western Amazon, mainly of Peru and western Brazil. An amazing bunch of migrant birds that we have here. The ruby-throated hummingbird, for those of you who put out hummingbird feeders, a good friend of the Land Trust, Peggy Brace, has been feeding them for years on Liberty Street, and maybe you should try a hummingbird feeder with some red-colored sugar water and be very much entertained by the ruby-throated hummingbirds. They got sort of rare with the DDT scare where so many insects were poisoned and a slow-flying insect is going to be taken by many birds and it's going to concentrate some bad uh, poisons in its system. But the hummingbird has come back now that we've banned DDT. We hear about the, you know, the loss of the bald eagles and ospreys and herons and cormorants, but even the hummingbird was affected. The belted kingfisher is one of our few birds that feeds on fish along the rivers. And the male is blue and white, but the female is blue, white, and chestnut. The female being more colorful than the male, which is rather unusual in the birds. And part of the reason for that is in the daytime, the more cryptically colored females tend to sit on the nest and are not so easily spotted by predators. And at night, mostly, uh, you never say always, we always avoid never in biology, 
and generally the male sits on the nest at night where it will not be seen by predators. On our woodpeckers, uh, we have a something called the red-bellied woodpecker, a very frustrating name since it has a white belly. Occasionally there's a pink wash between the legs, but you never see it because the bird is plastered against a tree. And that is one of the three birds that has such a variety of calls that when you hear songs and calls that you just can't recognize, it's either a blue jay, which can imitate many birds, uh, or it's a red-bellied woodpecker or a tufted titmouse. Uh, and the titmouse and the red-bellied woodpecker are among the birds that Henry Thoreau never saw. They have come north partly due to climate change and perhaps other factors. Other woodpeckers that we have here that have come north for the, uh, from the wintering grounds is the northern or yellow-shafted flicker, a bird which got Roger Torrey Peterson, the most famous naturalist in America in the 1900s. It got him interested in art and it got him interested in birds at the same moment in Jamestown, New York. And the flicker has black spots below, the male has a nice mustache stripe, and when it flies it has a white rump and bright yellow under the wing. A fabulous bird. It ought to be called Peterson's flicker. Another bird that we have, I'm now listening to Canada geese in the background, um, is the huge pileated woodpecker. The pileated woodpecker is a huge black woodpecker with a red crest, and we now have maybe ten pairs in Concord. Henry Thoreau never saw a pileated woodpecker. In fact, uh, it was probably just shot for sport or food back in the 1800s. And the first nest in Massachusetts, which was found in Mount Watatic, uh, about well, 10 towns west of here, was so important that it had an old, its own article uh, in a special ornithological magazine. It's the first nest in Massachusetts in many, many years. As we get into the songbirds, uh, one of them that you will see, oh, there's the red-bellied woodpecker calling, uh, is the eastern Phoebe, P-H-O-E-B-E, -E, a little brown flycatcher that wags its tail. There's a pair nesting right by or probably underneath the new rail trail bridge over the Assabet River here, and you're likely to see them near many bridges and a few barns. But it's an all-brown little flycatcher. Another flycatcher is the great crested flycatcher, which has no crest. Remember, most birds are named after their least conspicuous or non-existent field marks. But the great crested flycatcher goes weep, 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 and they should have called it the weeper flycatcher probably. And it is known for bringing up a shed snake skin and draping it over the hole in a tree of a former woodpecker nest to sort of scare egg-eating snakes that do climb trees to eat eggs and baby birds. Another flycatcher we have is the eastern kingbird. The eastern kingbird is blackish above, white below, with a big white band at the tip of the tail. And it's one of our furthest migrants. We only have two songbirds which fly all the way to Argentina for the winter. And that would be the eastern kingbird, which goes all the way down there, basically the Pantanal of Brazil, uh, for the winter during their summer when there's so many insects for it to eat. And I've seen flocks of thousands of eastern kingbirds flying over the treetops of the Amazon, and then they go over the Andes, through Central America, through Texas, and come right up here to Concord, Massachusetts for the summer. It's called the king of the birds because it, it's one of the few birds that will chase a crow or a red-tailed hawk flying over its nesting territory. So if you see a bird chasing a hawk, it's going to be an eastern kingbird, a red-winged blackbird, or a grackle. You'll never see a blue jay up in the sky chasing a hawk because they can't fly quite as fast or as deftly as the kingbird. Another bird that you hear but you very rarely see but is considered the commonest bird in the woodlands of the eastern U.S., it's called the red-eyed vireo. Looks like my eyes someday, probably today. Um, and a naturalist up in Mount Chikarawa in New Hampshire, a protege of Henry Thoreau, got really into nature and wanderings about and so forth. At the start of the day, sometime in July back in the 1800s, he made a little note every time the red-eyed vireo sang. And they sing in the hottest parts of the days in July and August before they go down to the Amazon. And he recorded over 12 thousand songs by this one male red-eyed vireo in one day, which means that these birds sing a quarter of a million times or more every summer as they raise their ugly little babies in their little cup nest high in the trees, and then they fly all the way down to the Amazon uh, for the winter. Among our swallows, the common one that's blue above and white below that nests in the bluebird and house sparrow boxes that we put up all over town. Uh, that is the tree swallow. It used to nest mainly 
uh, in little hollows in the trees or using abandoned woodpecker holes. Another swallow we have is the barn swallow, locally called the ban swallow, uh, and it nests uh, in unpainted old farm buildings and barns. And it's, it's gone down a little bit in uh, population because people paint the barns or old houses right to the, where the roof overhang is. And their nests don't stick to paint. But the old rusty gray wood, if you could leave the top few feet of some of your barns uh, unpainted, we would get more barn swallows that do eat a hell of a lot of mosquitoes. Among our wrens, wrens are little brown birds with a cocked up tail quite often. We have two species that are sort of common here. Uh, one is the Carolina wren that Henry never saw. It's, it's a recent immigrant from down south. There's a red-bellied woodpecker yakking in the background, but it has a white eyebrow and oft, sometimes will fly into your house. It loves cavities. If you have an unscreened window, you're probably going to have a Carolina wren. A smaller wren, that's here all year, by the way, the Carolina wren. Another bird that migrates in the wren family up here just for the summer is the house wren that takes over many of these bluebird boxes and actually repels bluebirds and chickadees from those particular nest boxes. The northern mockingbird, which I call the southern mockingbird, uh, was probably the rarest bird, other than a passenger pigeon in today's view, uh, that Henry saw was a mockingbird. And I thought, wow, that's great. And mockingbirds were really, really rare north of, say, New Jersey back in his day. And then in further reading, we found out it was a pretty common cage bird, it was probably an escaped cage bird, uh, the one mockingbird that he did see. But a relative of the mockingbird is native here. It's called the catbird or gray catbird. It's all slaty with a black tail, not as gifted a mimic as the mockingbird, uh, and it does include a number of meows in it. And it comes here from Central America. It does not go to the Amazon, but winters in places like Costa Rica, where so many of you have enjoyed a vacation or two. Another bird that's common here, you figure everybody knows it, but I went many years not being able to tell a male robin from a female robin. I didn't know, I didn't care, uh, but now that I care a little bit more, it's interesting, you can tell them apart. The male American robin, a beautiful singer of the thrush family, has a black head that contrasts with its gray back, whereas the female American robin, same size, same shape, same orange breast, has a gray back and a gray head with no contrast. See if you can tell the difference when you see your next robin on the ground, whether it's a male or a female robin. Uh, we also have the eastern bluebird, and a number of people here in town have done a great job uh, putting out nesting boxes, and especially those who are able to take away the house sparrows and inevitably try to take over many of their boxes. But the eastern bluebird has a very soft call that you may not even be conscious of. It's sort of a cheery, 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 but not very loud. It's the most unobtrusive, kind, you know, not in your face kind of a bird and non-pugnacious eastern bluebird. Also in the thrush family, and you don't see these birds too often, but they're fabulous singers in the woods, and Henry really enjoyed them, uh, is the wood thrush, which has a rusty cap and completely white breast and black spots below, big black spots. And amongst its calls, you can sort of interpret some as an EO lay, EO lay among its calls. The most gifted of our singing thrushes, and these occur up in the Esterbrook Woods around Punkatasset, and there's usually a pair or two south of Fairhaven Hill on the Land Trust Wright property that you can park in Arena Terrace and walk up over the south side of the hill towards Fairhaven Bay. And in the mornings and late evenings, uh, you'll often hear the beautiful fluty songs of the hermit thrush, which has a reddish tail, but hard to see. And there's a rarer thrush called the viri that's commoner out in the western hills, used to be commoner here than it is at the moment, with beautiful descending flute-like calls of the viri. But the thrushers are the things that really affected Henry Thoreau. He had some trouble telling them apart because you don't see them too often, uh, but beautiful sounds in the woods. Among our warblers, the one that has become very common is our white pines have matured. Our white pines were cut for ship masts uh, back in the 1800s and before, and then the hurricane of 38 knocked down many of our white pines, but as they've matured so much and are getting so common, there's a warbler that you'll hear. It sounds like a chipping sparrow, but a little more musical, up in the white pines, hard to see, and it is called the pine warbler, 
or if you're from Boston, it's the pine wobbler. One of the common birds, we have about 30 species of these little butterfly birds, so to speak, of warblers that come through here, particularly in the month of May, many of them headed further north to nest. And one of the more colorful ones, it's black with orange patches, is the American red start, not related to a similar named bird over in England of the fresh family. Uh, but a great bird to see, and it just fans its tails and flits around in the trees. Those of you who walk the dike at Great Meadows or go on some sort of a watercraft along any of our rivers in Concord, you're very likely this month, May, and on into June and July, to see and hear the yellow warbler. The male is bright yellow with chestnut stripes and uh, has a beautiful sweet, sweet, sweetie, sweet call. The yellow warbler. You will love that bird, that brilliant bird. Uh, another bird along the river sides and the marshy areas which has a black mask is called the yellow throat. And I remember taking some children on a nature walk here in Concord and I said to them, oh look at that little bird here with the yellow throat and the lone ranger mask. And one of the kids comes up to me and says, who the heck's the lone ranger? And that they didn't have such a show in recent days the way us kids did back in the 50s. He was a real superhero, but that is known as the yellow throat and it goes witchety, witchety, witchety. And if you make noises like pish, 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 psh, 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 you'll sometimes get a little curious and come up close to you. Another warbler that acts like a nuthatch in going down the trees uh, quite often is the black and white warbler, which we do see in the large trees along the rivers. In migration in May, there's another warbler. It's gone through a name change. We used to call it myrtle warbler. It's now called the yellow rumped or butter rump. Uh, warbler, uh, and it does not nest around here, but it passes through in big numbers in the first half of May, and it's a little bit late this year. I had two right behind me here a couple of days ago, but they are coming through. And then there's one of the warblers that is so beautiful, but it's common out in the Worcester Hills, and there's Canada geese yakking behind us, uh, which now nest all over the place, and the beautiful little yellow babies are around. Uh, but the magnolia warbler is one of our many migrants that comes through here and beautiful thing as you can see from the photograph. An interesting bird is called the oven bird, but back in Henry Thoreau's day it was called the teacher bird because it goes teacher, teacher, teacher. And it was the biggest mystery of all of Henry's ornithological observations. Because at night in Walden Woods and other places around town like the Estabrook, or if you go up to the October Farm Riverfront that the Land Trust has protected next to the new Audubon property of Brewster Woods, at night, you will hear this bird like a mockingbird going up in the sky at night. And Henry knew it, and he called it the night warbler, but he never saw it and never figured out what it was. But among the many songs that it gives at night, it includes teacher, 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 among many other calls, but he never connected it. It was one of his mysteries, and Ralph Waldo Emerson actually said, Henry, stop freaking out about the identity of the night warbler it would drive you nuts. Apparently it did. Um, among our getting near the end here, the red-winged blackbird is familiar to most of you who would walk the Great Meadows Trail or done anything along most of our rivers here in Concord. We're so fortunate to have three different rivers here in Concord and a number of other water sides. Is the red-winged blackbird that does not winter here uh, but has that beautiful red and yellow shoulder patch in the summertime and it's quite aggressive and you'll see it flying around. But most of you will not recognize at first glance the female of the red-winged blackbird, which looks like a big dark sparrow with heavy stripes below. But again, when you walk the dike trail at Great Meadows, and sorry about the parking lot being full these days, uh, due to that little virus problem we have, uh, you'll see a lot of the female red-winged blackbirds. <coughs> the big blackbird that you see flying around, much smaller than a crow though, but with a long tail, and a yellow eye is known as the common or eastern grackle, uh, related to the red-winged blackbird. And then another bird you'll see in grasslands and lawns called the buffalo bird out west, because that's where it was sort of encountered at first, and followed the herds of the bison around, and would lay its eggs in bobolink and meadowlark nests and keep moving because it fed on grasshoppers and locusts kicked up by the uh, moving herds of the bison. But it came east and it now lays, each female lays up to 40 eggs a summer. One in each nest that the male finds. And the male says, come over here and put your egg in the Baltimore Oriole nest, uh, the warbler nest, the vireo nest, the rose-breasted crow's beak nest. And then that baby cowbird 
elbows out the other siblings of its host family, and the male and the female feed only the baby cowbird as their young die on the ground uh, being eaten by ants. So it's considered the most dangerous bird in New England, the brown-headed cowbird. And the female is just all pure gray, no st striped spots or colors. Now, also in the same family is a wonderful bird known as the Baltimore Oriole. It's one of the very few birds named after a baseball team. And I hope we do get baseball back one of these years. The Baltimore Oriole makes this beautiful, woven, long, sock-like nest hanging from the tips of our few remaining elm trees, but other trees these days. Uh, gorgeous bird, beautiful whistling songs. And it winters down as far as, I've seen them in the Venezuelan Andes, but it winters from the highlands of Mexico down into northwest South America, the Baltimore Oriole. Another beautiful bird we have is the Scarlet Tanager, perhaps our most stunning bird. Even Henry Thoreau thought it was a splash of the tropics here in the summertime of New England, the Scarlet Tanager. The male is a brilliant glowing red with black wings and tail. The female happens to be cryptically colored uh, olive green. Uh, and there's probably a hundred pairs uh, here in Concord in our maturing oak woodlands, a great bird. Uh, and it winters completely in western Amazonia, uh, flying over three ranges of the Andes. Another colorful bird is the rose-breasted rosebeak. Uh, the male has that beautiful triangle of rose on the chest, a black head, and first patterns of black and white. And it will come to bird feeders in the summertime or in cold periods in May. Very thick beak on the rose-breasted rosebeak. Uh, they again wintered Mexico south into Panama. Uh, a small bird, you might not s notice it too much, it has a nice little call, it's called the indigo bunting, excuse me, and its song is a sweet, 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 it's six notes, two together, two lower, and two back up at the original pitch. The indigo bunting is a small bird, size of a sparrow, brilliant blue when you get good light on it, it doesn't happen too often on forest edge. The little sparrows you have in your front yard, which like to nest in blue spruce from Colorado, and various conifers, has a rusty cap, white eye line, and black line through the eye, and it's called the chipping sparrow. But when you're on a boat or near some uh, riverside vegetation, a very stripy sparrow that is here all year is the song sparrow, a beautiful singer, uh, mel species of melodia. The little reddish birds or pinkish birds that you see uh, are not native here. They're native from the western U.S., but we're escaped from some consignment at Kennedy Airport and spread from New York City throughout the eastern United States. It's called the House Finch. A beautiful singer, very plain females, but the male is quite pink. Finally, the bird I call the American Skylark uh, is called the American Goldfinch. Brilliant yellow with a black forehead. That's the male in the summertime. I wish they were this brilliant in the wintertime. Many more people would take up bird feeding if they did. But the goldfinch is the last bird to breed. It doesn't even build a nest until late June, and its young don't really come out until maybe even August, feeding on seeds. And the goldfinch male will go up in big circles in the sky over its defended territory, uh, singing its beautiful chicory chicory and other beautiful notes. And it just protects its territory from other male goldfinches as it circles like the skylarks do over the fields of Europe in their summer. And that is the American goldfinch. I hope that this has sort of intrigued you a little bit to get outdoors, maybe get some binoculars uh, and some field guides, and, and enjoy the many birds for which Concord is home to. We are home to maybe 250 different kinds of birds in a given year, if we counted every rarity, and there's lots of birders in town, and we hope that you will support the Concord Land Conservation Trust and other good organizations, and uh, thank all the wonderful people that have come before you that have saved so much land and there's still more land that we're looking to purchase uh, that are significant to wildlife and to the people and the birds here in Concord. Thank you. Peter Alden, over and out.